Thanks, Monty, and thanks to you all for being here this evening. So the ocean, that's where we're going to now, into the marine environment. Lord Goldsmith stole a lot of my great facts, so just to reiterate a few of those, the ocean gives us so, so much. More than 50% of the oxygen we breathe comes from plants in the ocean, which just blows my mind still. We are so used to making that association with trees on land, but not so much in the ocean. And now, evidence is pointing towards better ocean protection is our best chance of limiting the negative impacts of climate change. And so, protecting this important ecosystem is, well, more important than ever. I was lucky enough to be in the islands this summer uh, for a really, really special research expedition. And this photo is taken in the west of Fernandina Island, in the very west of the archipelago. So this is looking out to the Pacific Ocean, where the next land is Asia. Almost half of our planet is covered with the ocean. And we were there to measure change. Next year is the 25th anniversary of the original Galapagos Marine Reserve. So we've heard the amazing news about the recent extension. Um, but we have a long way to go to make sure that this uh, biodiversity is protected in the long term. So we were there to measure what's changed in important species populations in that time, but also what's changed in the, the threats that we're seeing. So ocean biodiversity around Galapagos is particularly special. It's a hugely productive environment, and we can have a look at some of the science behind that it's primarily due to these amazing currents that we see. So it's a, we can see um, there's warmer currents coming from the north, from Panama. So this allows more tropically adapted species to live in the archipelago. And then polar adapted species can also live in the archipelago due to the cold Peruvian or Humboldt current and the cold deep water upwelling in the west where I was there, which really is that hub of marine productivity in the west where we were. So here's some shots, and th this is who I was with. This is where I had this incredible experience. It was all thanks to Dr. Sylvia Earle and her NGO Mission Blue. So the PI for the trip was Alex Hearn, Dr. Alex Hearn. But Sylvia filled us with so much inspiration. She, well, one thing which she always said is like, we're not going to see what lives there, it's who lives there. Like, Marine life takes on a completely different um, meaning when you're with someone like Sylvia. She's in her 80s, and she was doing extremely challenging dives, including night dives to find a really cool fish species called a red-lit batfish, and I know we've got some fans in the audience of that. I'll show you a photo if you've never seen one. Um, but we were also with a group of, of young female researchers and national park rangers, um, and we learned so much from her and her experiences, especially what it was like for her coming up in ocean science in the 60s. And we were sharing stories about what has changed in that time and how many more female scientists we've got running the show in many cases, but some of the challenges that we all do still face as well. I do think it's important to recognize that there's still some work to be done for things to be truly equal. But you can see in that picture up there, there was a submarine on this vessel. So I knew that before I was going to be on it, but I never thought that I would get the opportunity to be in it. But Sylvia being Sylvia wanted us all to experience this environment. So let me show you a little bit of what we saw. So this is 200 meters depth. And the amount of biodiversity we saw was stunning. All of us were incredibly shocked, actually. This piece of seafloor has never been surveyed, so we are the only humans who saw this, who have ever seen this, with, with human eyeballs. You can see corals, you can see sea fans, we can see sponges, we could, you could see many fish, juvenile fish, we could see crustaceans, mollusks, all kinds of animals. That all of us as marine biologists, every night we came back to the boat, we watched the two or three hours of sub footage all together, completely wrapped better than any series you could get on, well, any provider. Honestly, we were just, everything was just like there, and Sylvia would be right up to the screen, being like, this is this, this is this. It was absolutely phenomenal. Now, it's so special to have this deep sea submersible in Galapagos that we had a special visit from the Minister of Environment, Gustavo Manrique. And so he went down in the sub with Sylvia, 
And he was learning all about the challenges that we face, particularly in deep sea conservation. So there's a lot of threats of potential deep sea mining exploration. Um, there's issues of, of destructive fishing, not here in the marine reserve, but more generally. Um, so he came down with Sylvia and look at this phenomenal experience that they had. Can, can you do it with your head? Right over your head. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. This just, it didn't happen right now. Unbelievable. He tried to kiss you. Can you imagine? It, it tried to kiss him. Like, c can you imagine, like, how incredible that experience must have been? And although we were all incredibly jealous that he saw a sunfish mola mola down there at 80 meters, there isn't anybody we would have rather had that experience um, to really see, like, that magic of the deep sea and how important it is for us to keep on this quest to continue protecting more and raising the, the case study of the great stuff that is happening in Galapagos on the international stage to try and inspire more places to follow the example. So the health of this deep sea biodiversity which we were learning about really impacts, well, everything else that we see. This is a, a more typical reef system that's linked with the health of the deep sea. And then going on to the terrestrial system as well, this is an image from one of our uh, annual drone surveys, which is looking at populations of marine iguanas, unfortunately also looking at plastics washing up. But here you can see again, this is in the west in Fernandina, this extraordinary productivity where we can see turtles, sea lions, and these thousands of iguanas. So we can see that this part is very, very productive environment that is a priority to, to protect. So we've already heard about this new expansion uh, and we've heard about the, the ambitions to support countries to get to 30% um, protection by 2030. And that's what we're, um, we're dedicated to doing now. So how can we support uh, the Ecuadorian government? How can we support the local communities to make, make this um, a reality? But what we need is multi-levels of protection. We need it to be effective. We need that vertical protection from the shorelines to the deep sea. We also need the geographic spatial um, protection as well. And we need a holistic view of how we're tackling threats because things like climate change, fishing, plastics, all interact with each other. What you can see on this animation here is some uh, whale shark tags. Sorry, well, whale sharks that have been tagged. And this is an important part of, of what we're doing um, currently is trying to understand more about the migration paths of, of whale sharks and other shark species too. And to try and understand um, how particularly they're crossing over these um, huge industrial fishing zones. And we've seen, seen this happen already. Tags are lost fairly frequently. Um, we can see that a, a tag that was showing normal swimming behavior suddenly is just going very steady in a straight line where it's most likely landed on a boat. Um, from fishing activity, etc. Um, so yeah, this is the takeaway really. We need ocean protection at all levels and this is a truly global effort to make this happen. So one of the issues we are talking about this evening uh, is that of plastic pollution. So this photo is taken by Anne, who's lucky enough to go to Tortuga Bay on many mornings for, for a, a nice walk. Now one morning, she collected all of these bottles in just one very small area of the beach, uh, which is particularly unusual. There's like 55 of, of them, I think it was, something like that. And they all look fairly new. So it seems like they've been in the environment not for a very long time and have probably entered quite close to the islands as well. So that's another piece of what we're doing in this research is trying to trace where are the plastics coming from that are washing up in Galapagos who is responsible, and then to design solutions of what we can do about it so that we don't end up continuing to see this increase. We find all kinds of, of items on the shores. Um, we have a really awesome collaboration with the University of Exeter. Many of the team are here tonight. Um, oh, yeah, this video here shows you what Lord Goldsmith was talking about. So with this beach that on the surface looks like there isn't really anything going on, you can see when we sieve the sand and it passes through with the water, all these bits of plastic coming out. And they're the ones we can see. 
So plastic continues to break down and break down into smaller and smaller particles. And the reason why we care about that is because the smaller the plastic is, the easier it is for more animals to ingest it. And so that accumulation becomes more of a risk. But in the positive thing, as I said, this collaboration with the University of Exeter has grown and grown. And thanks to um, support from the UK government through the GCRF funding and an incredible uh, long-term supporter of our the Evolution Education Trust, we've managed to really boost this effort for plastics and take what we'd started in Galapagos at a relatively small scale to now be working on the regional scale. So we have um, activities in Ecuador, in the mainland as well as the islands, in Peru and in Chile as well. And so we're really excited about how we can continue to um, grow these efforts collaboratively. And can I just say this group is so inspirational that I feel so proud to be a part of them. And it's all about the people, like Monty said. We've got some incredible people who are so passionate about solving this issue that although it can be a bit depressing, at time, or very depressing at times, we do have a chance to do something about it. And there is a growing political will to support this too all around the world. And the main thing it's all leading up to is Global Plastics Treaty, which is something which we're very um, keen to support, as um, we heard from the ambassador earlier. Um, how can we support this kind of connection between policy, between research, and between the local community to really make solutions that are going to last in the long term?